Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yarek Langer. I am a, a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan and part of the research papers team for the conference. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce to you uh, Kyle Dubas, who will be speaking on how analytics has limited the impact of cognitive bias on personnel decisions. The presentation is going to be about 20 minutes. Afterwards, we'll have about five minutes of Q&A. So please hold your questions till the end. Um, raise your hand, and I'll try to get you a microphone. And just make sure you speak into the mic so that everyone can hear the questions. Um, with that, um, please join me in now welcoming Kyle Dubas. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to jump right into it here so that we leave more time at the end for, for questions. Um, obviously, now I, I work for the Toronto Maple Leafs, but I'm, I'm going to more reflect back on my actual experience working in, with the team and, and entering into a situation where we incorporated analytics into a situation and, and have a couple more years out so we can reference it and have a better frame of reference for the impact that it can make uh, in every regard of, of, a, of an operation. I'm going to just start and go back. That's, uh, that's a photo of my, of my grandfather and myself. So when I, I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, which is a small town, isolated town in northern Ontario, and my grandfather and I were obsessed with baseball, and every Tuesday we would go to this little newsstand in the mall called International News, and we would buy Baseball Weekly. And I became obsessed with the statistics section at the very back of the Baseball Weekly. And my grandfather always would ask the question to me about everything, hockey, life, school, baseball, whatever it may be, the question was always, how does it all work? So throughout my entire life, I've always had a, a passion to figure out how does it all work? Uh, and, and what that's led me to do is become very fortunate. I had my grandfather and then I became very interested as I was going through high school and then into university with different types of, of use of, st of statistics in all sports and different areas of life and what we could draw from that, what we can analyze from that. Um, I want to just say one thing and, and that's I'm very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to learn from a number of those people or things on, on that screen there. I'm not a statistician by trade, mathematician, computer engineer, so on and so forth. So a lot of what I've learned about uh, analytics in hockey has come from the people on that screen. There's, there's far, far more, but I don't think it's, it's fair for, for me to, uh, to present myself as anything other than a student of these people, some of these people that you see here. And those are the people that I've, that I've learned the most from. I have Twitter on there because if you go back about 10 years, uh, you would have to wait for two people on oilfans.com to log on and check their accounts and, and go back and forth to get a response on something that was going to advance hockey. Twitter has now made the discussion in real time. Stephen Birch and David Johnson will argue about something and it may seem uh, to be confrontational, but for me I learned from it. They're challenging one another in real time on things that we're talking about in, in hockey and analytics in hockey. Uh, and then at the bottom of the screen are, are two gentlemen that I work with in Sault Ste. Marie, Tyson Enfield and Matt Rodell. And then the current team that, uh, that I work with with the Maple Leafs, Daryl Metcalf, Rob Pettipiece and Cam Schron. And, and they deserve far more credit than anything that I do for the things that we have done and that we will be doing. And hopefully they deserve credit. You guys will all be the judge of that soon. Um, so when I went to Sault Ste. Marie, the, we, we decided that we were going to incorporate use of analytics into our decision making process and into our organization. And that's year one. So at around, I'll use this, at around this point right here of our season, we trade nine things, seven draft picks, two players, for a goaltender, Jack Campbell, Dallas Stars first round pick. My thinking at the time was that we were okay, we were pretty good, and that if we traded for an elite goaltender, we would have a chance to be extremely successful. And uh, I was very wrong, as you can see. We missed the playoffs, and that year was a massive failure. From that, you learn quite a bit. If you go through the schedule, if you go down here, around right here was a time when I had to miss this conference three years ago because our team had a very important game against the Peterborough Peets. If we didn't win, we'd be eliminated from the playoffs. And then at the end of the year, you get to the end of the year, and you basically say, oh, shit. I thought that analytics was supposed to help us, you know, it was just supposed to help us be good. And that's what you see now. In the NHL, there's been a, a very, as you all know, a very big rush this summer, in particular, for teams to gain, uh, bring on people who are very proficient in analytics. 
And what's happened is those teams magically overnight haven't transformed into a contender, transformed the way they are. And people will all jump on and say, I told you that that analytics shit didn't work. Those teams are no good. You can go on my Twitter timeline after every game the Maple Leafs lose and see it firsthand if you'd like. <laughs> so what did we learn after that year? And I think after that year, I, I valued something that I always knew which is that there's a massive difference between just collecting data and information and actually valuing it and using it to build it into your processes of how you're going to guide your team. Basically, you learn the difference between statistics, raw statistics and data, ga uh, data gathering and using, those, using that data to incorporate into your process as a team. And there you see, I'm just going to point out one main thing here. So, when I was getting ready to do this presentation, I, 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 I bounced between two topics. Number one was to use this line right here is in 2012, 2013. And what we did at that point right there where you see that gray line is we made a coaching change. That was in my second season in Sault Ste. Marie. So I was getting ready to do this presentation. I, was, I, I had two topics that I, I thought I wanted to talk about. Number one was the value of coaching and the value of organizational buy-in to analytics and use of statistics. And number two was the elimination or the ways that analytics can teach you how to handle uh, and defeat cognitive bias in your personnel decisions. So you see here, this is year two in Sault Ste. Marie. So we're on this slope downward. This is cumulative shot differential or possession or whatever you want to call it, Corsi, SAT, whatever they've branded it now. And right here, we make a coaching change. In that season, with Sheldon Keefe as our coach, we went from being, in the first 30 games, our, our shot, uh, our Corsi percentage was 47%. In the remaining 38 games, it was 57%. It's a 21% difference in, in our shot differential, or, percent, or possession percentage. And that's the same, exact same roster, different coach. What I learned at that time was the extreme value of having buy-in all throughout your organization, the fact that that takes time. If your, general, if your president, general manager, coach, scouts, everybody buys into using what you can gain from statistics and analytics, you're going to have a lot more success than if you have one person on your staff alone saying this is important and trying to gather buy-in from everybody else. What it leads to is this quote right here. A couple weeks ago, the Toronto Maple Leafs were playing and losing, and James Myrtle took it on himself to let everybody know that the two Greyhounds were 36, 9, and 2 demolishing an opponent, and that that was a team actually built by analytics. I'm going to say something that many Toronto Maple Leaf management people have said before, which is that James Myrtle is wrong. <laughs> His point was well taken and it was correct, but it wasn't actually why I'm here, is that it wasn't actually the builder, per se. It, analytics served as more of a teacher for me and for our staff than it was, as a, than it was a builder. And what it taught me was that this line that you hear in every sport, it's an eyeballs business and so on and so forth. What analytics taught me was that your eyes and your mind, they're lying sons of bitches in the worst <laughs> absolute way. So you go, to, and I'm going to now talk about the impact of limiting cognitive bias when you're making personnel decisions and limiting the impact of your eyes and your mind, which can fool you drastically if you allow them to. I just have some biases up on the screen that as, as I've gone through and, and have taught myself more about analytics and learned from our staff and from people on the internet who are, who are putting stuff out for debate and to, uh, to try to educate ourselves and others, I've just I've listed, we could talk forever about cognitive bias and its impact, but I want to talk very, very briefly about a few of them and, and give some examples on how realizing what those biases are can help and has helped me and us limit uh, the impact of those biases when we're making decisions. Uh, the first one I'll, I, I'll talk about is recency bias. And I, I find that recency bias is most harmful or can hurt us most in this time right now. So we have the trade deadline coming up on Monday. You're in a discussion with the team and the team says, we want player X from you. And we say, okay, what are you going to give us? And they say, we'll give you prospect A, B, and C in a fourth round pick. So then immediately, the, the initial reaction is to open the floodgates and unleash our scouts. And they rush to pick an American League city anywhere, Binghamton, to watch the Binghamton Senators and prospects A, B, and C. And then they come back and they say, prospect B was great, 
prospect C was awful and prospect A was just okay. So immediately then our, our discussion shifts to honing in on prospect B. So we're eliminating hundreds of games that we've scouted of this player and many different data points that we have and we're putting it all on one game on February the 23rd, 2015 when we've watched this player for four or five years. And this is a common thing and, and I've done this myself and I still do it myself. I know in my mind after the World Juniors I was making my draft list for the upcoming draft and, and I saw as I thought I'd finished my list free and clear of all these biases that I had the players who had played in the World Juniors who were eligible for the draft ranked fi far higher than the players who hadn't. And this, because a player plays in the World Juniors at 17, make him a better prospect than someone that doesn't. I don't think so. And I think we know that from years of going through it and measuring out very different points. The other time that recency bias can, can really hurt us and myself is in training camp. We have years of data and information and scouting reports on players. Player comes into camp, he has a good training camp, we put him on the team and we take off a player who for years has proven himself to be better and we take him, we put him in the, in the minors or we release him and somebody claims him on waivers. So it's, it's when we get stuck in those recency, uh, recency bias and sample size bias that we become hurt as a team and as an organization. And those have been the main things that I've found that have hindered me and that I've learned from over time. The other main one that I'll touch on because I want to leave some time for questions is simplicity bias. So growing up in scouting, which is what I did, I started scouting for the Sioux when I was 17 years old. There was always, I found in our scouting room, and then so thus I was learning from people far older than me, there was always a strong bias towards safe players who would keep it simple. So we would be scouting, we'd be building our list, we'd be in our scouting meeting, and I'd hear veteran scout A say, you don't, why don't you like that player? And I said, well, I don't think he's very good. And he would say, you need a player like him to win. He keeps it simple. When the game is on the line, you can count on him. And I said, oh, okay, that must be true, because this guy's been scouting for 10 years, and I'm 17, and I'm trying to learn. So sure, okay. So I started incorporating that into my reports, and so on and so forth. And what I've learned over time is that we automatically check down to something that's simple to explain. So a big defenseman who just takes the puck and gets it off the glass and out and hits people is extremely valuable to our eyes because we notice it every single day. But is it truly effective? Is he always only in his own end or is he using his skills to move the puck up the ice or is he just continually putting it out and then having to defend it coming back? So I've tried to always question myself about I hate that term we just need to play a simple game or he plays a simple game. And through use of analytics, and I think a lot of people in here would know this, that players who play like that generally only play on defense. And that's not really where any team wants to play. So the, the final thing I guess I've, I've learned is to accept everything as, as part of, accept everything that happens in hockey as contributors to our success um, or failure. Last year in the playoffs, we played the Erie Otters, and we lost in four straight games. And I went back to our owners, and they said, how do we lose in four straight games? I thought, you know, the, the media said we were, gonna, we were gonna play six or seven games against them. Their goalie had a 970 save percentage. Our goalie had a 910. So we shot the puck in their net about 2.5% of the time that we, that we had it, which is unsustainably bad. But it's very difficult, and, and just one other sidebar here before I close out is that when you're trying to explain PDO to owners and very prominent business people as I tried to do yesterday, very difficult thing to do. When they say, well, what does PDO stand for? And you say, well, it's the name of an internet uh, commenter who made this up. And they look at you like, what, what are we paying this guy for? Like, <laughs> so if you want to, not to, not to slag PDO, but if you want to give a more sophisticated answer to it, our, my friends in the R&D team with the Leafs came up with a, a acronym for it. So, Percentage driven outcome. Well, that's the percentage of our outcome. That, that, was, that was what was driven by percentages in our outcome. There you go. <laughs> and then the bottom line is just the difference between knowing and valuing. I think there's a lot of things in, in hockey and in all sports that we know but we don't value. So, for example, I'll just a very easy one is penalty differential. You know, you, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, well, of course we know that. We've known that for years. But you, know, you never really hear it along the line. So when you can put a value on, on a player that's able to draw a penalty, just using that example alone, it's a very valuable thing to a team. And when you can say for every penalty drawn, uh, you're going to score 18% of the time, that's 0.18 goals, that five penalties drawn equals one goal, 
then people start to draw value to it and they start to key on and say, okay, well, we get that and that works. Um, mod thing that I've heard this year is to, uh, to keep my chin up. You know, it must be really hard with the Leafs not doing well. And I think the answer that I always give people is that it's the, the blue line there on the screen is, is the Leafs this year. So just the same track as Sault Ste. Marie and, and then the blue line is the Leafs. And my answer is, you know, I've been through this and seen this before. It's part of the process. It takes time for you to, to climb up. It doesn't happen overnight. So when you're using analytics and people are slagging you and they're saying, well, you know, I thought this was supposed to change everything. What about your numbers? It's not magic. It's really not magic. It's a process and it's hard work and it's difficult and you have to push your way through it. And the most important thing that I've learned coming to this conference was last year was from Sean Foley, the golf coach and instructor from Canada. And he gave me this line, and it's not really to do with being young. It's, he said to me, you know, we were talking, and he was giving me his story, and, and I was sharing with him mine. And he said, you know, when you're young and you're different, people at first laugh at you, and, you know, he added, you know, they're, they're, they're nice to you. They think you're interesting. Or, but then when they get intimidated, and then when they get intimidated by it, they'll try to tear you down. So when they see that you have staying power, they'll try to tear you down. And that's how you know you're making your mark. So I guess my, my message is, a lot of people will say to me, how, you know, if I'm interested in analytics, how do I fit into hockey? And my, my response is that you don't have to fit into hockey. Hockey will fit into you. Just look at every other sport. You don't have to change who you are, how you do anything. Just keep doing what you do. Be yourself, and, and everything will be, turn out just fine, as it has in every other sport. And that's it. I'll take uh, questions. If you can just raise your hand and I'll get you the mic and just speak loudly into the mic so we can. Uh, so how do you balance recency bias uh, versus genuine improvement? Like for example, if someone really works hard over the summer and they show that uh, they're a better player than they were the, uh, the previous year, how do you balance rewarding previous performance versus a general, uh, genuine improvement? I guess my response would be, how are, how are we measuring genuine improvement? Like when a player comes into training camp, you have an idea of how, you know, you can, you can see him and see if he's improved, right? You know, you're, you're taking all his measurables from the year before, so taking his height and weight and conditioning level, and you're incorporating that into say, that's how much he's improved his conditioning level, height and weight, and then on the ice, does he look different? And you're, whatever you're measuring in training camp on the ice, it's, I think training camp is such a small sample that it, it doesn't give you a real genuine look into whether a player has improved dramatically. So in most of these players' cases, we can put them in with our minor league team and, see if, and genuinely see if they can sustain that improvement that you're referencing. Are there any more questions? Hi. So transitioning from the O to the NHL, right. um, how much have you found the cap has actually affected your ability to build based on that model of we have a, shot differential. We actually have a, a great uh, capologist and, and CBA guru who's sitting in, in the back here. Um, to me, it hasn't, it hasn't really, um, you know, you have to be able to fit players in, but to me that also gives you a massive opportunity to find inefficiencies in the market, whatever they may be, to find players that are on lower salaries that have, that have for whatever reason, haven't been valued properly before. And that, that's my favorite thing to do in, in all of this is to, try to find inefficiencies and then what's the next inefficiency and continue to move on down the line because it's not going to stay an inefficiency for for long it's going to it's going to go away other people are going to catch on it's not a big secret i don't think daniel winnick will be available next year on july 29th as an example other questions hi you spoke about the create not the creative the simplicity bias taking effect in scouting it seems um from larry onoff's piece later this week that is also a factor in coaching and every other level of the game. How do you possibly break through that in the long term if you're trying to look for things that right. are, let's say, more risky than right. safe? I, I think you can use data and information to show. In, it's, it's always interesting. I look back on Sault Ste. Marie and I, especially I watch them now and uh, under the leadership of Kyle Raptus and Sheldon Keep there in the way that the team plays. Uh, there's, there, they have, and they've educated the players on, you know, this is a simple play, but it's not a good play. There's, I think if you can differentiate to the players, if, you know, you, we've never inundated our players with the percentages or what their possession numbers were, but if you could educate them and give them some data and background and encourage them to be creative, to use their skill, 
that it's, that will help break through that. If you reinforce it and you say, hey, listen, this is an acceptable turnover. If you're gonna try something creative or, and that, that isn't simple by definition, if you can say to them, this is what we'll accept as a turnover and as a mistake. And then the first time that the mistake happens, when they come back to the bench, you're not screaming at them and saying, why did you turn it over there? That, there's a trust that's built, and that helps the team and the player grow. But that is a massive issue as well. And, and I hate when I read in, the, in a quote from a, a player, you know, we just need to keep it simple. I don't know what that means, keep it simple. It really bothers me. Anyway. Oh, we've got a question right over here. <laughs> On that note of keeping it simple, how do you go about approaching communicating the nuances of, of data and statistics in a world where you often do need to boil down some analysis just to make it you know, clear to uh, superiors and other folks? So you're, just, so I'm, just so I got your question right, you're asking how we go about taking data and numbers analyzing them and then presenting that to people who yeah, may not yeah. be familiar. Presenting complex data, right. complex analysis right. to, in, in a simple way. Right. I think that the best way to do it is, is to visually show the end result of what you're doing. So if you notice something that another team is doing or a strategic nuance within the game that you can exploit when you're going to play a team or that you can exploit with, with a, for a player within the game, that it's e always easiest if we can show it with either photos or with video. Because giving, giving a coach or a, a player who has no idea a mountain of data and just raw numbers is going to lead us nowhere. And we're gonna, then, then they're going to be confused and it's going to set us back. So it's try to make it, uh, you have to try to mold the way that you're teaching it or, or, or presenting it in a way that you know is going to get through to the coaches. And then the coaches then in turn have to be able to understand it well enough to go to the players. Do we have a question over here? Are there any other questions? Hi, uh, can analytics make more of an impact on the personnel side or the coaching side in hockey? Well, I have a sample size of one time going through a coaching change um, where the new coach coming in was very progressive and, and very open to learning everything that what our analytics department could generate and give to him and in incorporating those things in. I think if you put the two, to, I think they have to work together. Uh, I don't know what the raw impact or greater impact will be on, but as you, I think if you look through other sports as, as our guide, the, the organizations that have that approach from top down, so it, you know, right from the president of the team through to the personnel decisions of the players that go into the room on the medical side, so on and so forth, it, it has the greatest impact overall. Um, but I've lived with seeing what a, what a change in coaching can do and in strategy can do with the exact same group of players. No change to the group of players. In fact, one player left. We traded one guy, added nobody to the team, and you could see the impact of a coach. Um, I believe it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very influential area. If you have a coach that isn't really buying into it and, and you're bringing in personnel that, that are fitting, a to uh, that are analytics friendly, and you have a coach that isn't, it's not going to work. So they have to work together. They can't work separately, in my opinion. We have time for one more quick question, if anyone has one. All right, don't see anyone. Um, in that case, please join me in thanking Kyle Dubas.